Yeah. I mean, I feel like Flansburg really sounds like the kid you went to summer camp with. <laughs> you know? It's Flansburg! Not a, it's not a normal... <laughs> Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Today's episode is brought to you by The Perfect Match, a game where designers submit mood boards created with Adobe stock assets and earn the chance to play on a live game show to win big. As designers, we pitch great ideas through visuals all day, every day. But how well does our design communicate? Do clients and higher ups really understand the work we put in front of them? Well, let's find out. Test your skills by assembling a brand inspired mood board with Adobe stock images to the perfect match. And if your skillful project is chosen, you could be featured on Adobe's monthly live streaming game show with other groovy designers, art directors, and creatives where the winner goes home with $750. It's free to participate in the perfect match and just submitting an entry gets you coffee for your time. Visit theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed to learn more and get ready to bring your design skills to win. That's theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed to learn more. Thanks again to The Perfect Match for sponsoring today's episode. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm honored to be chatting with John Flainsberg, one half of the dynamic duo that is They Might Be Giants. As you can only imagine, my response when I received the email, hey, this is John from They Might Be Giants, and we'd like to share our book with you in hopes that we can figure out a chat on your podcast. Well, spoiler alert, I was pretty excited to make that happen. So of course I said yes. Like I, many of you may know them from songs such as Istanbul, not Constantinople, I, Palindrome, I, Particle Man, Birdhouse in Your Soul, or maybe even that theme song to Malcolm in the Middle. But today we're talking to John about their latest project. Their new book and album, which is fittingly entitled The Book, is a collaboration between the band, past obsessed show guest designer Paul Sayre, and photographer Brian Carlson. I was lucky enough to get a preview copy just a few days ago, and as I understand, this is one of only two copies of this gorgeous book that exists so far in nature, so pretty cool. Uh, I'm excited to learn more about John and the book, and they might be giants, so without further ado, Here's my conversation with John Plansberg. Hey, Josh. Hey, John. You're uh, coming to us all the way from uh, Sullivan County, New York. I understand. Yeah. 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 It's, the Cats- it's the Catskill Mountains. It's where, uh, you know, uh, broad comedy was born. Um it's just like two hours north of New York City. Excellent. Well, the last time that I saw you in person, I think it was April of 1997, and I was a sophomore at Purdue University, and you guys were doing an outdoor show. And I remember you guys did a couple songs with uh, puppets of yourselves on giant sticks. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That was a uh, that was a uh, a ve- yeah that <laughs> yeah that was a weird little bit of performance art for you. Um, <laughs> and it was outdoors. Because usually we would do that with just two very small spotlights on the head. So they were kind of floating disembodied above the room, which was very haunted. But I guess we just decided, why not Why not do those songs in a festival setting? So outside, that, that surprises me. Because we're yeah. usually... I may be misremembering you know, this, but I think it was a little drizzly too. Like it was kind of... Kind of gross oh, outside. Sure. It, yeah. If it doesn't rain at the outdoor rock concert, what kind of concert is it? <laughs> That's right. And the other fun fact that I just feel like I should pass along to you is like every time I assemble IKEA furniture, I sing a little particle board, particle board as I'm putting the things <laughs> oh. together. So oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I I've you know, I've always been sort of a junk shop person. I've got, you know, most of my furniture comes from you know, it's sort of like one rung below Ikea. And the first time I went into Ikea was only, I guess, like 10 years ago. And I was like, oh, wow, this is like where half the people I know get all their furniture. Like I, I, could, <laughs> I could recognize a million things in the place. It was crazy. It's all my furniture, but firsthand. Um, yes. But, you know, we're not here just to reminisce for me, but um, we're definitely going to talk about book. But I feel like it might be fun for some of our uh, listeners because when we interview designers, we always ask them kind of about their origin story. 
maybe you can give us a little bit of the background of they might be giants, like how you formed and where the name came from or as much as you care to share with us. Um, well, you know, they might be giants is, is a, a, a heavy duty musical collaboration between me and John Linnell. And, um, we started in the very early eighties. John was in sort of a serious, well, not a serious band, no, no bands are that serious, but, um, he was in a band that had like, that had sort of clear professional goals and were pretty successful in kind of an immediate club gigging way. And, uh, so they might be giants was kind of started with real. I mean, I don't think we really had a clear notion of, of like where it was going, but I think the notion was to try to do something that was just really fun for us in the immediate sense. Um, and not try to figure out how to backwards engineer a band to be commercially successful. And I th- and that I think might even be a recessive trait for a lot of musicians. It's, you know, it's, it's hard to be in a, it's hard to break through in a band. And I think a lot of people, you know, they're, they're trying to, they sort of set their band up in a way to, uh, with some form of calculation to either be with the, immediate zeitgeist of what the musical scene is at or where the musical scene is going. So they will be part of the vanguard of what's happening next in music. Um, I think for me and John, we, we kind of, we kind of gave up early on that and it ended up just being a much uh, slower and lower road to what ultimately about seven years later uh, was presented as some kind of overnight success. (laughs) <laughs> well, this might be an odd question, but you know, you kind of alluded to this a little bit. I think they might be giants has always had this very unique sense of humor or kind of flavor to it. When, when you were initially writing songs or initially doing things together, was it with that intent of kind of like this, you know, this quirkiness of the music or did it just sort of happen naturally when the two of you were together in the room? Well, you know, it's very much, I mean, the band is very much a reflection of our sensibilities and our shared sensibilities. We saw a lot of concerts together as teenagers, um, you know, as young teenagers, John and I went to uh, see, see like Frank Zappa concerts. And we saw a lot of, uh, I mean, I am, I was 17 in 1977. So I was the exact age to get into punk rock. And in a lot of ways, I mean, I think the only reason I'm in a band is that the whole punk rock event happened. Not, not because like, you know, we are, you know, have some tremendous affinity for, uh, you know, the, the, the style of early punk rock so much as it was like this interesting amnesty day for, uh, civilians who were music fans. I mean, I think up until then being in a band, there was, you know, it was still the, before that it was the era of, uh, uh, prog rock kind of, and even California bands that were kind of folky would have like a lot of solos and there was, the emphasis was really on musicianship. So punk rock was a great sort of excuse if you were, a terrible guitar player or not even a real guitar player to learn how to play guitar. And that kind of got me off the sidelines. I think I, you know, I was very intimidated by the idea of, of uh, being a real musician. Um, but I love music tremendously. So it was like very late in the day. I, I really, I learned how to, I had a job in a parking lot and I had a guitar that a friend of mine had given me when I was like 17. And uh, I just really just, I just learned how to play in the parking lot. And you guys included a lot of, um, I would say atypical to the, to the rock scene (laughs) instruments, you know, with a accordion and other, other fun stuff. Like, so was that, um, you know, just like what, what can we add from left field or was it more like those were instruments that you guys played when you were younger or what, what brought some of those to the fold? Well, you know, we are a New York City band. I mean, we started in Brooklyn and our big aspiration was to be able to get to gigs on the subway. So we were trying to streamline uh, our setup as a band. Um, And uh, originally John was playing a Farfisa organ. We played with a drum machine. Um, Actually, more specifically, we played with an open reel tape recorder playing tapes of rhythm tracks that we put together drum machines actually 
this is this I feel like a thousand years old saying this. Drum <laughs> machines hadn't really been invented exactly when we started the band. That it was all that was all very much emerging technology. There was um uh there were a couple of of extremely cheap drum machines that didn't sound at all like drums and there were a couple of really expensive drum machines that didn't sound very much like drums but there wasn't much in between so we actually put together these tapes on a four track tape recorder uh in various different ways john had a moog synthesizer uh it was my four track and we would just kind of concoct these rhythm section sounds kind of doing bass and and percussion or bass and drums and uh that was that was our strategy. You know, we didn't really want the tape to overwhelm the show because it even just from the, a theatrical point of view, it seemed really obvious that if the, there was too much going on uh, in that department, it kind of turned into it, it, it over. It just became a track act. So uh, so John was playing keyboards. I was playing electric guitar and we had this tape. And then as we started doing more shows, it was like, OK, instead of the real thrill, we'll do it, have it be on a cassette tape. And instead of being the the keyboard, it'll be the accordion. And that way it's like one hand amp, one hand guitar, one hand accordion, one hand cassette recorder. We're good. <laughs> That's awesome. And now fast forward to 2021, you guys have over 20 albums, right? Yeah. And a, and a semi to take us our equipment to the shows and a dozen people on the tour bus. So yeah, it's uh it's really, it's time to get back to our basics. So I've got the book oh, here. You, it's oh, uh, it's oh, big and orange. Do. Beautiful. It's a real, it's a yeah. real thing. Um, this is also not your first collaboration with with Paul Sayre. I remember uh, when we interviewed him a couple of years back, uh, it was shortly after he had done the monster truck hearse made out of cardboard and destroyed it, which was, uh, I thought, was a, was a pretty fun project with uh, that song was called When Will You Die, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and was sort of like the tour announcement to like, so I know we're here to talk about the book, but I have to ask about the monster truck hearse. Like, how did <laughs> how did that whole thing come to be? Oh well, you know, it's interesting at the at the top of the this when you were introducing me, uh, you you mentioned the cold call. I mean, the tradition of of cold calls is is pretty long uh, with me. I mean, I find even on our very first album, the uh, the artist who did the cover was this a fellow named Rodney Allen Greenblatt who. It was a very, very popular figure in the East Village art scene in the 80s. And um, that was, you know, somebody had his phone number and I was like, I'll leave a message on his phone machine and get him to do our cover. And he's already successful. So maybe he'll even do it for free. And uh, I don't know if we ended up paying him or not, but he was very game. And, and I have to say, I'm very grateful for that. But like, uh, it was a very similar deal with Paul. I I'd seen, I'd sort of been tracking his illustrations in the New York Times. And um, I had gone to his website and seen his, like his, you know, book work. And I thought, you know, this guy's got, really got an interesting style. I, it was only after I started working with Paul that I realized that he was a very successful uh, graphic designer. Like he was a much bigger deal in that world than uh, I knew. Um, he did the cover. The first project we did together was the Pink Hearse uh, cover for Join Us. And, you know, there's a lot of death imagery in They Might Be Giant songs. And uh, it, so it seemed it seemed very appropriate. He did a lot of sketches for that cover. And it was a really sort of fertile moment for just generating imagery. Um, and then as we were talking about uh, how to kind of expand the, the, the package, or, you know, the album cover package. I was like, you know, I always like PDFs and paper arts kind of things that are get included. And maybe we could do something that's like an award, like a, like a trophy uh, for the album. And he was like, oh no, let's do, let's do a, a miniature model of like a car model of the, uh, the pink hearse. And I was like, well, that sounds cool. And he did it. And then, you know, you could just hit a button at a hundred percent and it would print out this thing on a piece of paper that you could fold into, uh, you know, a scale model of a, of a funny car, big wheel hearse. And then he was like, then he had the idea to print it out at a thousand percent or 10,000 percent, which basically would create a nine foot tall, completely inoperable paper hearse. 
And that's what the video of when will you die is about. And I, I won't, I won't tell you how the video ends. I don't want to spoil it for people, but it's, it's well worth checking out. It's uh, the, the vehicle is, uh, is unsafe at any speed. <laughs> well, I did just uh, rewatch that on YouTube uh, yesterday. So we'll, we'll link to that in the show notes as well as, uh, as I mentioned before, Paul was a guest a couple of years back on, on obsessed show. So we'll, we'll throw that, uh, link all the way back from season two in the show notes. And Paul, if you're watching, we should, uh, we should get you back on for another, another follow-up. Um, I am curious about the book though, because there's music associated with that, which came first, was it, Hey, let's do a book together. And then, you know, songs sort of naturally became part of that or did the music start and inspire the book? Uh, well, there was sort of a couple of things happening at the same time. Um, I guess a couple of years ago, we were approached by a, a, a somebody that knows Paul about doing an art book, sort of a retrospective art book about They Might Be Giants. And one of the weird things about being in a band for, you know, 35 years or whatever, is that there are all these opportunities to kind of see your tombstone getting carved. And um, <laughs> like, you know, it, like as interesting as that project would probably be to a lot of people, and, and, and it might actually be the most interesting project we could do as a book to just have like a sort of a photographic compendium of the history of the band's career. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's sort of an orientation that I think John and I kind of recoil from a little bit. It's like, it's, it's, for us, just on a personal level, the thing that keeps the project going is that is that we keep the project going. So, like doing a new book about new songs with you know collaborating with new people um, is kind of what keeps the band alive. So, the idea of a book was very appealing, um, you know, especially as like the reasons to make albums kind of recedes. Um, you know, streaming audio is kind of shattered the notion of of why you even make albums anymore um but uh, you know and maybe i'm maybe i'm just you know maybe i'm just sentimental i mean i don't i don't think of myself as like a big old baby boomer but uh but in a sense you know just that fondness for the physical experience of listening to music in this kind of uh psychedelic like letting the music kind of overwhelm your senses and having a having a a record album or having a piece of printed material in front of you as you're listening to music is a very potent way to take in music. And I felt like, I felt like that if with the project, with the project book, the album and the the book are called book. And I apologize if it's confusing, but um, it just seemed like this beautiful way to kind of expand the experience of, of what, listening to a new album is in 2021. Well, I mean, speaking of which, presumably this thing started during COVID and, you know, was, is wrapping up while we're still sort of in this, how was that process different, uh, in the songwriting and the production, like talk through how, how that impacted, um, getting this project, uh, out the door. Oh, well, I mean, it actually, sort of interrupt we were almost finished with the album and had like plans to do photography sessions with brian carlson when the whole thing happened so in a lot of ways it sort of delayed everything in this very unfortunate way i mean we would have finished you know nine months earlier if we had if if for not if not for covid but it wasn't like we got a tremendous amount of more work in um you know, the whole thing has been just sort of a strange mess. Uh, I mean, one thing I found out about making a book that I never really realized is that there's like this six months or five month interval that the that the book is just on a pallet in a boat floating from China back to the United States, <laughs> um, which is, you know, not exactly, it doesn't seem particularly efficient, but I guess it's a very low carbon footprint when, it, when you're just relying on something to kind of float along. Um, uh, it just feels you know, like it's the, like floating aimlessly, like they'll get here eventually, <laughs> probably. Well, five, five, five months, it doesn't seem like the world is five months, or, you know, distance. Like, what's the rate that the, that the boat's going at? But it's, you know, it's, that's fine. That's fine. It's, it's, it's just the tide. <laughs> yeah, it's kind <laughs> it's of no beautiful. engine. Um, but, uh, you know, 
we had working with Paul is a great collaboration. You know, like if you, you know, for somebody like me who like, I mean, I'm, you know, you know, as, as uh, the title of your show sort of alludes to, you know, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with uh, design and, and my dad was an architect and I grew up in a very sort of theoretical modernist house. And uh, so having a collaboration with, a designer like Paul has been very rewarding for me. Like it's allowed me to kind of, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's just great to, to be able to work with somebody who can, who has the same level of intensity about uh, design as, as I do. And it's into the, the project. And, you know, I mean, I feel like we've worked with, we, I mean, we've worked with a ton of great designers over the years and, uh, I've always managed to kind of exhaust their enthusiasm <laughs> just by by uh, having too too many too many thoughts and trying to sort of take things to too many levels. And the uh, the wild thing about Paul is that he just he just seems to live off of that. He feeds off that. He, well, I'm, I do crazy. really love that's the crazy. aesthetic elements of the book, the the fabric cover and the you know the typewriter elements and. Um, and even like the, the embossed feeling of the typewriter on the fabric book and the, you know. Oh yeah. It's a, it's a beautiful object. I mean, one thing that I think Paul and I, uh, you know, discussed a lot was like how to present it, uh, with more dignity than the average like rock book had. Like it, we, it was important to kind of come up with some bold ideas about how to present the lyrics, how to present the photography, have it really look like an art book rather than just look like some messy rock book. A most, a lot of rock books, music books try to do everything with the design, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. that was, we really uh, wanted to be more careful than that, than that. So was a lot of the photography that, that Brian selected for the book, was that stuff that he shot for the book or is this more of like a compendium of his recent work? This is really like a folio of his work from the last, like probably, probably at least three or four years. Um, you know, uh, he, you know, Brian, uh, is a Pratt graduate and does street photography for, you know, this is, I, I, I should probably explain to people the book, the book project is uh, They Might Be Giants album, in, and we're working in collaboration with Paul, who is the book designer. But he, Paul also did these illustrations, typing the lyrics on an IBM Selector typewriter by hand. And he, he sort of created various uh, typographical illustrations, shapes, and, and uh, sometimes sort of diagrammatical things with these lyrics that... Um, it's it's essentially uh, concrete poetry, which is comes out of like you know Dadaism and uh, the early twentieth century. But it's much easier to understand than it is to explain. I've found um, because I think everyone sees it and they know what he's driving at. Like you know, they'll, there's a lot of different approaches, but it's all very visually engaging. And so half of the pages are these uh, beautiful, strange select IBM Selectric typewritten illustrations of lyrics. And the other half are, are photographs by Brian Carlson, who is a street photographer. And the, uh, the, you know, he's, he shoots in Brooklyn and um, there's something about street photography. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of street, of photog art photography in general, but like street photography is, is kind of, you know, one of the nice, more interesting corners of it. And, uh, and I think, uh, Brian is, is a really great, you know, new voice in that world. Um, so, uh, we really curated the, the, the imagery, you know, we, he, he basically just, uh, handed over like a tremendous number of images and, um, we just sort of, Paul and I sort of set about aligning them to, uh, you know, to the various songs, you know, just things that correlated in one way or another, you know, I mean, there's a song on the album called If Day for Winnipeg, that's this like extremely dystopian uh, track. And, you know, we just, we just found, you know, uh, the most startling image that would sort of support that notion. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of, of a triangulation. It's a little bit of an abstraction. We didn't, we're not like, 
there are a lot of nouns in They Might Be Giants song, songs lyrics. So we, tr- in general, I think we did a pretty good job of avoiding like, you know, having a photograph of a dog in the in the song that's about a dog. But like, uh, but still, like, I, I think I think uh, just in the in the spirit of psychedelia, uh, the book succeeds very well. Yeah, without giving much away about the image, I, I really enjoyed the one with the the multiple skeletons. <laughs> just the, the angle <laughs> that's of an that amazing shot. photograph. Yeah. You know, I mean, one thing that that's, was interesting talking to to Brian, you know, over the the months that we were working on the book, is I realized that, um, you know, he's out there being a street photographer. He's he's out shooting like every day. He's shooting all the time, which is like such a a a different relationship to the outside world than I think I would ever ha- have. I mean, I'm, I, I really feel like I spend my entire day just staring at a computer screen. So it's, it's amazing to me to think of somebody who's like going out every day for hours and hours and, and finding those situations. And, and there are a lot of situations in the book where you just like, wow, he was there when that happened. <laughs> exactly. It's just like, uh, almost like a hunter. Like he's just out there looking for the thing to happen and he finds it. It's some, some really striking imagery. Um, so, you know, in my mind, I would put this sort of in the category loosely of a concept album where there's like, you know, all the, all the imagery in the book that kind of goes along with it. Um, I don't know if you guys see it in that, in that light specifically. I'm just curious if there were other projects or other concept albums that inspired this, that, you know, was this something on your list of things that you thought you'd do someday? Or was it more that like Paul brought you this idea and you're like, eh, okay, I guess we'll do that. <laughs> um, no, uh, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I mean, I was an adult before I even thought I would ever be a professional musician. So like I, my, I don't have like a lot of like childhood dreams invested in like all the projects I, I'm going to do. I mean, I wonder, I wonder if, if uh, I don't know, I mean, it's interesting to see somebody like Kanye West at this point, who's like, you know, making, you know, like f- clothes. Um, so, you know, obviously some people have, you know, dreams that go well past uh, just making music. Um, you know, writing songs is is, is hard enough for me. Um, <laughs> but uh, but you know, I guess I guess the truth is, it's like I. You know, I went to art school and I worked, I kind of toiled in publishing as a, as a, um, a paste up artist. And I always, you know, I have all this graphic design background, um, professionally. And so I, you know, I, I was from really from the very beginning of the band, I was ambitious about, uh, the graphic design impact of the band and, um, so over the years, there have been various things that have come up that I felt confident we could do a good job with. Um, you know, we got to do a, a couple of kids' books um, a few years back, and those were those were big projects um, for us uh, and very different. Um, but you know, it's it's just it's interesting just to do different stuff. You know, I mean, we've worked on TV shows, we've worked on, you know, f- you know, a couple of film things. It's like just doing the, all those things, even if they don't get that much notice um, uh, it, by the general public, because they don't fit into like the. You know, I mean, we did the music for uh, the Daily Show for years, and I don't think anybody knows we worked on the Daily Show. Like, we didn't get any credit on the. Mm-hmm. You know, it, the the scroll at the end of the show went by in this like comically fast way. I think everybody <laughs> who worked on the Daily Show was just like. I really wish they would slow that thing down just a little bit. Like pretend that you want to give people some kind of credit. But so we, you know, we did the music for that and like, uh, you know, put together these orchestral cues. And it was like, it was, it was definitely a stretch for us. And, and, you know, uh, John Linnell did an amazing job with a a lot of those arrangements, but um, it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it's just such it's interesting to do different stuff. And, and I guess that's, that's the real, the real thing is just to keep it going. That's really interesting. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not totally shocked by you owning up to the the graphic design background. Like I, I feel like I see that in the aesthetic of, of what you guys have done over the years, but, but I am surprised by it and that I, I didn't know that going into the interview. So 
So that's really oh, cool. Yeah. I mean, that's, as soon as you said yeah. paste up, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> like, right. That's a graphic design if, word. If you ever need to, if you ever need any stats, I can uh, definitely put them together for you. <laughs> no, I, I, I was uh, like 2% of our listeners know what a stat is, I think, but uh, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, well, part of it is like I, I worked in, in design from, you know, through the trend from when the, the era when everything was really physical into the era when everything was really computerized. So seeing that transition was also really interesting. Um, there are a lot of things you could do in the physical world that had, that were kind of cool that n- people seem to not ever do now at all. But uh, I mean, obviously the computer thing makes it a lot easier, but the, you know, the offices went from being, you know, 14 people doing in the art department to two. So it was an intense transition. So also while I was at Purdue, I, I worked as a designer, my, I think a little bit, my junior and senior year for their printing company that was on campus. And, mm-hmm. and I, uh, <laughs> sort of lucked into my own office, but it was because I was sharing a room with the photo stack camera that nobody used anymore. So I was just in the camera room still the, with the camera still, still in there. Right. So it was a, uh, it was a nice big room with very little space in it. Um, you know, one question that we ask a lot of our designers who are on the show is to tell us a little bit about their team. Like, you know, some, some firms are intentionally small and some, you know, are going to presumably take over the world with hundreds or thousands of staff. And, um, you guys obviously present largely as just the two of you tell us a little bit about the team that is, they might be giants and kind of how you guys, you know, have, have worked with other folks in the past. Well, you know, um, one of the luckiest things that happened to us professionally uh, was that we teamed up with our first manager, Jamie Kitman, and he uh, was just out of law school. I have no idea what his aspirations were. I, I, I sort of got the idea that he didn't aspire to be a rock manager at all, um, but he started managing the band and... Um, what was fascinating to me about him that uh, it took me a very, very long time to kind of understand is how much uh, he he filtered the world out from us. Like, you know, of the how much of the world he filtered out uh, and allowed us to kind of do our thing. Like we, you know, we said we kind of made a lot of really unreasonable declarations early on and he completely abided by them. I mean, we didn't, we didn't really open for any other bands, which is like strategically Mm. uh, like just something that I think almost anybody would try whatever they could to talk you out of. Not that opening for other bands is this great. uh, I mean, it could be a character building experience, but it's certainly not, it's not the most pleasurable thing that most bands do. Uh, but the main thing is that, you know, you just get in front of much bigger audiences and get your your music out there into the world. And we were just like, nah, you know, and <laughs> and that was OK. Like may, maybe maybe, it was, you know, maybe he was naive in thinking that you could do it some other way. But it was a it was definitely a much lower, slower road. But uh, but we had, a, you know, a, so anyway, Jamie was our manager until I guess like last year. So uh, and now he's he's like retired from music completely. I mean, we've been you know we worked together for like over thirty something years. So it was a pretty great run. But you know we've had the same booking agent, we've had the same manager. We've really um, we just work with the same people over and over again, which is makes it a lot easier. When we go out on the road, we have a, it, it really is big. Um, you know, it feels big. Like there's like, there is a dozen people on the bus and, um, and the only thing that's happening is the show. So it, it, that always does feel like a big deal. But when, it, when, when we get off the road, it, it can, it can start feeling pretty, pretty small again. Uh, I'm curious what a typical, you know, day or week is like for you when you're not touring. So when you're not out doing shows, like how often are you working on new music or, you know, practicing old stuff or, you know, what's that look like for you? Uh, I, you know, I, uh, I have my little vocal workout. (laughs) I've got, I've got my, uh, my, uh, 
guitar scales. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of my sonic exploration is uh, a lot of, you know, these days, a, a lot of times it's computer based and I'm sort of coming up with uh, rhythm tracks and, you know, working with drum machines and working with sounds and samples and uh, making sample libraries. And a lot of the, a lot of that stuff almost is like the stuff you do before you start writing a song. Um, it's, it's, it's like, it's like the lab work, uh, before, uh, before you actually start doing the experimentation. It's like, or like, a what is the cooking term? Like the maison place, oh, you know, like mm -hmm. when you, when you put out all the ingredients, um, there's something I, I personally, I find it very pleasurable to just, um, cull, a lot of interesting sounds together because it just reminds me that there's like the promise of, of new, of new sounds. And, and if there are new sounds then there can be more new songs. Um, so that kind of experimentation and that kind of research work is, seems very different than the task of actually putting together a song, but it does seem like it's part of the process. Um, so I do that almost almost on a daily basis. Um, but, uh, you know, there's an unlimited call for new music and they might be giants. I mean, we're doing, we do work for higher stuff for television where, you know, we'll have to do sound libraries that are incredibly long. And, uh, so no matter what, what we're working on, it seems like there's actually a destination for it. Um, but, you know, ultimately, it's just about writing songs. And that's, you know, that can be waking up in the middle of the night and writing down a couplet, or it can be trading files back and forth between me and John. You know, it's like, it's it's a very kind of low level uh, mental illness feeling, you know, like you just, it's, it's being kind of permanently distracted. But, uh, but that's my job. So I guess it's not, it's not a distraction. You mentioned uh, the Daily Show, and that few people would probably know that you guys had worked on that. Any other? Um, you mentioned all the the television and kind of production requests that you guys get. Anything else that you're you're really excited about from uh, recent work from TV? Well, we're we're you know we're talking to people. I there's one thing that's on the horizon right now that um, uh, I can't. I can't, I realize I can't talk about in the public forum because we haven't really gotten the gig yet. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, we haven't, we, we haven't done that much. I, it really peaked right before 2008. Like I think somehow in the world of ad, we were doing a lot of advertising and we did this one enormous job for Dunkin' Donuts, uh, which sounds really pedestrian. I mean, when you people, when you hear like, Oh, they did jingles for a donut, company it sounds like well that sounds pretty dreary but actually it was this it was a really fun and and pretty creative uh ad campaign and they did like dozens of commercials and we contributed all these original songs and and the guy we were uh collaborating with this fellow named tim Colley. he was like very very creative guy in boston and um it was just fun it was just a really interesting odd gig it was kind of a dream gig in a way like you know they would just give us a instead of telling us what the commercial was going to be they would just give us a list of a, a bunch of words and just say if you can write a song with like this sentence in it that would be fine <laughs> and so we just and so there would just be these like 60 second and 30 second long songs with these crazy ideas and uh it was just a lot of fun this is sometimes a bit of a stretch question because it's kind of like choosing your favorite child or, or, you know, trying to brag on the spot, which is tough sometimes. But what do you think of as like your proudest professional moment? Oh, wow. I mean, I'll be honest, like, you know, I, I think you couldn't find two people who would make more merciless fun of the Grammys uh, before <laughs> we won a Grammy. Uh, and now we just think like, Oh, Grammys are great. Uh, um, you know, I mean, winning a Grammy was really good explanation to my parents as to what I did for a living. You know, it actually all seemed like maybe not 
a mistake. Um, so that was that was kind of validating, and but in a very abstract way. And I mean, I think you know, ultimately, there is something about awards that are kind of jive, but but it still feels good to get recognized for stuff like that. Um, we've actually had conversations about whether or not. I mean, I have I have no idea. I have no sense that we are going to get into if I figure if the Pixies aren't in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, like we are definitely not getting into the <laughs> Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But uh, I have had a conversation with John that, um, you know, a, a few years back, the Sex Pistols very notably did not participate. They were, you know, they got put into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and they did not participate at all. Which is a very sex pistol thing to do. Like, I mean, what do the <laughs> they sex protested pistols mean? Their inclusion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what do the sex pistols mean as a band if they're not if they're going to actually allow themselves, you know, if they're going to go to the induction ceremony and and do that stuff? And uh, so this sort of prompted a conversation between me and John, and it was just like, yeah, let's just if we get nominated or if we get in, like, let's just skip all that stuff. And I and uh, so. So I guess we kind of uh, we're just not looking for that level of uh, validation, but um, you know, I mean, I'll tell you, I mean, I've, I've I have said this in other interviews in sort of different contexts for different reasons, but like um, I have had the experience of going into like guitar shops uh, and meeting guys who are you know into like some kind of rock hardcore super hardcore music um and you know they've they're they're got they've got all the trappings of like those lifestyle choices like they're fully committed to like that stuff and they'll either recognize me or they'll find out that I'm in the band they might be giants and they'll be and it's just it's just clear that they have very fond associations with the band and also think of the band as kind of like some kind of cultural lighthouse to get, you know, to be independent or to be autonomous or just to do your own thing. And it's really interesting to me to see that because it's like, obviously just culturally, there's something irreducible about a band that stands apart in the way that we've stood apart as a band. And um, the fact that somebody who's obviously, you know, so committed to some other kind of musical style can see the value in what we're doing. And that just seems, that just seems like really interesting, high praise. Yeah. That's super cool. Um, you know, for a lot of our designer interviews, we'll ask them if, if they have their own design heroes that, you know, folks they looked up to coming up in the, in the industry with you having a little graphic design background and, and of course the musical background, uh, maybe you can take this this question however you want, but um, curious if you have any any folks that, from a creative standpoint, design or musically that that you uh, kind of looked up to coming up in the biz, um, or or maybe if you want to totally sidestep that question, I'm I'm also curious what you're listening to right now. Well, I'm listening to Shay's Lounge by Wet Leg, which is a, a track I would strongly advise anybody to look up on Spotify. But, um, you know, I really like the design work of uh, of Charles Eames, and I like the film work of Charles Eames. And mm, I like the uh, sensibility that he brought to, like when he did sort of collage efforts, there's this, um, there's this sort of palette it's almost like the graphic design equivalent of like world beat. Like he, he wasn't just a modernist in, you know, I think people look to Charles Eames and Charles and Ray Eames output and think it's this very pure uh, distillation of these modernist impulses. But when you see his films, you know, there's all, I mean, obviously the, a lot of the films have like toys in them and stuff. So there's this kind of almost steampunk thing going on, but there's also just like the use of like, um, you know, uh, like Eastern images and, and um, uh, like fabric and textiles and patterns. And when you see the way he appreciates like, uh, serif type, 
it's like he likes he likes serifs more than a lot of people like serifs, and certainly more than a lot of modernist designers like serifs. It's like he's intrigued by the the shapes that uh, you know uh, serifs introduce to the to design. So it's like I, I just find like some there's something very worldly about his point of view that I really appreciate, and I like. Um, I like the photography of Robert Frank, who's uh, he did he did the cover of uh, Exile on Main Street, and is kind of this German expat who did a very famous book called The Americans. That for people who are not into photography, would I think would find pretty interesting. His stuff is uh, it's not as technical as a lot of other photographers. His photography is really kind of brutal in a way, or often brutal. But um, he's a great street photographer. That is, I think, a more nuanced answer than I usually get from from fellow graphic designers. So, uh, well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question that I do ask everybody, though, who's been on the show, it's kind of the theme of the show. I'm curious what you find it is that you are most obsessed with right now. Most obsessed with? Well, there's... Um, this is... Uh, this is a really hard thing to explain. There's um, there's this emerging technology in digital music that um, oh god I can't I can't even explain it. It works in such a weird way. Everybody knows how like sampling works now, like how looping like a musical phrase like Ice Ice Baby comes from under pressure and it's like doom 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 so you know that there's this thing like sort of plucked out and then repeated. But there's a new kind of um computer preset that instead of taking instead of looping things, it actually uh can find the uh it can, it can find the moment of peak transience, which is, is just like basically the loudest moment of a musical passage. And it can automatically uh, present you with 30 or 40 musical events over the course of a song that you throw into this bot, this little thing. Um, and every key that you hit on a keyboard will just play the, that peak blast out. And... Um, there's a couple of devices that do this thing, and it's really hard to say what it's good for because I I don't <laughs> I don't know I, I mean it's it it's it's one of those things where like if you're in the world of digital music making you're just kind of experiencing this possibility and going like that is that is super <laughs> fucked up but I have no idea what good could come out of it it's <laughs> it's I mean I it, to be perfectly honest it is. It's a classic uh, thing to be obsessed with because it's, I mean, it's like a lot of, there's a lot of things about electronic music making that are much more interesting to do than they are to hear, you know? So um, trying to figure out what it actually could accomplish is, is unclear, but uh, the, the actual potential of it seems kind of unlimited to me right now. <laughs> I love that. That's what you're most obsessed with right now. That's awesome. I'm just trying to figure out what to do with it. <laughs> I've totally been there from, a, from yeah. a design perspective for, for sure. Like, Oh, I can, you can do that. that hmm. Well, I always wonder, uh, how like, am I going to use if, that? Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've crossed paths with the, the, um, Jonathan Hoffler, the guy who did the type, oh, type yeah. Hoffler type foundry. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, I don't know if he, he was working before, like, Fontographer, but I get the feeling like that must have been a game changer if you were a font designer. I mean, in mm -hmm. a way, maybe it just seems like it's opening the gates of hell to all sorts of bad ideas. Um, <laughs> but it does seem like it would be a game changer, and just in terms of how you would set your stuff up. I mean, you could, I don't know. The technology, it's a double edged sword, this technology, I'm telling you. <laughs> It's not going to last. It's the classic. Just because you can doesn't right. mean you should. Right. Um, so obviously you've you've been in a successful touring recording act uh, for thirty some years now, and you've done children's music and theme songs for TV shows. You've done book. I'm just curious, like what's 
what's next for you guys? Is there anything else that they might be giants is excited <laughs> to, uh, to dip a toe in? Uh, you know, I've, I've, I do say this in interviews. I would love to do a Pixar movie. I feel like the, I feel like Pixar mm. hasn't really done any music driven uh, movies. And I don't think that's their orientation by temperament, but I feel like uh, we could bring something to that that could be of interest um, and have a real point of view. But, I, you know, they're pretty successful on their own. I don't think they need us. Yeah, I'm just I, throwing it out there. That I'm sounds out very there. interesting. I mean, I, I immediately thought of when you said music driven, I immediately thought of like Baby Driver, where like I think the director talked about the 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 music sort of being another character oh, in right. the film. And right, right, right. Oh, well, much, I mean that. Yeah. What is the name of that director? I'm trying to remember. His yeah, name. I'm totally spacing it too. He's, he did. He did the. Uh, he did that other super music driven movie that was kind of incredible. That seems like it was sort of underestimated in its day. Uh, it was from a graphic novel. Uh, I'll remember it as soon as we stop recording. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll link in the show notes to that director's name and maybe yes. an intro sequence. If you can find that on, on YouTube. <laughs> Thank God for show notes. <laughs> That's right. Um, well also, I mean, we, we've talked a lot of, um, you know, the fun, exciting stuff. I'm curious, like what it's like when you get stuck, like if you hit a rough spot or something, like how do you deal with that? Or how do you kind of get back to, to fresh level creativity? Well, I mean, I, I guess, you know, just circling back to what I was saying about the kind of like uh, the experimental inquiry into culling sounds, that's sort of my default, um, uh, that's when when I don't feel like up to like the marathon of of starting and finishing a song, which I feel like more and more is the state of mind I have to be in. Like there's something you really have to have like uh you know two cups of very strong coffee and a and a lot of free time to to finish a song. It's frustrating having uh the songwriting process interrupted, um, but but as just like a daily thing, I, I do try to. Uh, kind of get into the sound making part of it. Um, but it, yeah, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a curious process. Um, I do feel like I suffer from writer's block, but it's not, it's, it's more uh, out of not wanting to repeat what we've done before more than, out of the frustration of not feeling capable of writing a song. I feel like I'm completely capable of rewriting a lot of songs that I've already written. Um, it's just fine. Figuring out what else is new is, is really the, the, the goal. So I, I feel like this is definitely true in design. And I'm curious if this, if you find this to be true in, in music and songwriting as well, like, you know, once you're kind of in a world, you see things differently than everybody else. And there are little things that other people do that kind of, kind of like drive you crazy or trends that happen. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious if there's anything that, that has been happening or is happening now in, in music or recording that, that kind of drives you crazy. Well, you know, people are, a lot of people talk about how autotune drives them crazy and how they think it's kind of unnecessary. I, I find it, find autotune to be kind of a little bit of a relief, um, uh, but, uh, you know, I love the fact that I've lived in a time where like hip hop has become a really big part of the culture because the sonics of hip hop are so liberated from the sonics of rock and roll, which seems so, um, defined at a certain point. Um, you know, there's something very, uh, cinematic about, about the hip hop aesthetic, you know, there's like the, the, like the lows have never been lower and the highs have never been higher. So like as an electronic musician, having a form of popular music on the horizon, not a form of like experimental music on the horizon, that's sort of widely accepted and widely easily understood like hip hop. It's just a fantastic, uh, sort of open invitation to like, change, you know, work with a bigger palette. But, um, you know, I mean, there's some things that, 
I mean, there's some things, there are technical things I understand now that I, that I didn't really have a grasp on when we first started. Um, I mean, one, one thing that's odd about like recorded music is that um, reverb dates music so quickly. And if you don't include reverb, like if you listen to a Neil Young record from 1972, it just seems like he's in the room with you. And which makes the recording seem like it was made today. Uh, and, and in a weird way, it's like the best argument against technology. And I feel like that's something that people don't realize. Even musicians don't realize. Like people love, a lot of musicians love reverb. They feel like reverb makes it sound real and reverb makes it sound slick and professional and and vivid. And, and it makes it sound like a recording. Like it's uniquely... It's an it's a kind of effect that only exists in recorded music. So if, uh, in the same way that like it's interesting to see a photograph develop in a dark room, putting adding reverb to a recording is this way. It's this sort of a validation, like oh, this really is a real thing. This really is a real recording. But if you can kind of deny yourself that momentary pleasure of tossing on reverb, uh, you can end up with a recording that just seems much more transcendent. Mm, that's that's really interesting. Um, if you were if you're not working in music, what do you think you'd be doing? Oh, I'd, I'd definitely be doing graphic design. I was I was obsessed with design as a kid um, and obsessed with typography and obsessed with all the stuff that is very specific to graphic design. Um, this is. Uh, this is a really weird thing to, to mention because it's also, again, it's completely archaic now. But as a child, I was a, I was very aware of um, if you had like a workbook as a kid, if they had made, a, had made a correction on the typography, there'd be like a patch of text that would be sort of a slightly different weight because it was all done – it was all oh, done. Yeah. It was just very different than computer-based systems. Where so, like, if any correction was made, it would be slightly visible, not like the not like a drop shadow on the patch, but actually just like the weight of the text. And I was so, I mean, I was a terrible reader. I'm a terrible speller, you know. So it's like I don't even know where or where this comes from or why. I was so fixated on this. Maybe it was just because I was staring so long at the words, but I would always be aware of this weird thing. And um, that is, that has just always been my obsession. I just, I, I, I love graphic design. It's like a, a forensics <laughs> element yeah. to the, yeah, exactly. to the design. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, what do you think is, either one of your favorite pieces of advice that you've received or one of your favorite pieces of advice to pass along to others? Well, I have been asked this question before. And the, the great thing is that uh, I spent like, uh, you know, the better part of like $50,000 on art, art school education. And I got one really good, easily transferable piece of advice from a drawing teacher in my foundation year at Pratt, which was um, if if you make five drawings, chances are one of them will be really good. And if you make 10 drawings, chances are two of them will be really good. And um, just that general notion of like kind of hitting it hard, you know, like just not being precious with the materials, being rigorous with the materials and and embarking on more than one idea, more than one take on an idea and that you that you are capable of of approaching things in different ways. That was such profoundly good advice and it was completely transferable to writing songs. If um both John and I do this kind of nuts thing with songwriting where we'll sit down and literally just, you know, set a timer and just set it to like 15 minutes or a half hour or whatever, and just work on a song, just try to get as much out onto the tape recorder, into the computer as possible. And then when the time's up, just do it again. And the first one is usually pretty awkward, but like once you actually get in the groove of it, by the time you're doing like the second or third or fourth track of that day, it could be 
the the lack of premeditation, the lack of preciousness with it, you can get some good stuff going. It's 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 surprising how much how much good material can come out of working in that kind of spontaneous way. You know, I me personally, I have a lot of like I think perfect perfectionism driven procrastination. So um, yeah, you know, when I'm up against the deadline. I'll, I'm just fine. Like I'll, I'll run flat out when I'm up against the deadline, but when I've got three weeks to work on something, I'm just not, I don't feel quite as driven to like jump in and get after it. But I love that idea of setting a timer and saying, okay, I've got the next 50 minutes or hour and a half or 20 minutes or whatever to just do as much as I can on this. I just think that's a really, a really yeah. interesting approach. Yeah. I think, you know, in terms of workflow, we're all, everybody in the modern world is up against this weird thing of like uh, finishing before you even start. When you're working on with computers, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of uh, open invitations to start kind of the process of winding things up in before you're even really might have come upon the best way to approach it. Because all the tools of, of polishing it are right in front of you. And I think that's also kind of like a, a little bit of a, of a trap, but um, yeah, I mean, deadlines are really good. It's also, I mean, having, I have to say having worked, I mean, when we started working, doing TV stuff, you know, part of it was because like we were broke, you know, we were just, you know, we were a band, we had been, you know, pretty much on the road for 10 years and we were coming home from touring without really having, made any money and it was just like how are we going to how are we going to you know pay our stupid rents in New York City if if we don't make more money so we you know we took on TV jobs but one of the things that was great is doing advertising and doing especially advertising but TV as well it's like the deadlines are insane you know like you got to you got to call on a <laughs> Thursday and they're like can you do a full song to, by tomorrow afternoon and the of course the only answer is yes you know that's the only way you get the gig so so suddenly work figuring out being able to figure out how to work um within those crazy deadlines you end up with a bunch of really interesting and, and kind of good skills you know you you sort of uh up until then, you know, we spent 10 years making albums where the process just got slower and slower and slower. And there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, investing time and stuff. But some, but if you know where you can save time, it's, it's, it's nice. John, it's been awesome chatting with you. You've had some, some fascinating stories and, uh, and really given our listeners some, some, kind of peeks behind the curtain into a world that at least our show really hasn't delved into uh, yet so far. Um, but before we let you go, I'm, I'm curious if you have any, um, any asks or encouragement of our listeners. Um, well, I've got an open question for you. I was on years ago, I was on a show called design matters with Debbie Millman. Yeah. And um, uh, it was, there were students kind of, it was me and Debbie in like this control room talking. And then there were all these students in the other room uh, observing and the interview happened. And then afterwards there was a whole Q and a portion of the program. And it was, it was really interesting. What was weird is that the, although the interview was like, you know, she was like very kind to have me on the show. And it was like a very interesting, you know, and very flattering thing to be participate in for me. Um, what was, uh, the most interesting thing was the conversation that happened afterwards, which was uh, we had a we well we had a conversation we had a conversation. I, I mentioned that I thought branding was the worst word, the worst way to brand the idea of branding that anyone could ever come up with because just the term is like so awkward and ugly and uh, you know just seems almost brutal. Uh, so it's just like how can that be the word to describe the idea? Um, but the other thing was we got into a conversation about retro design and how in this era that we live in, so many things are, it seems like people feel like if they have a fresh bit of reference material that they can emulate completely, that is enough to be a whole take on their graphic design. And I'm just wondering, like, I know, I mean, I know like retro design is very popular 
and I and I love a lot of the impulses of retro design completely. I mean, I you know uh, we did uh, we've we've uh, worked with this illustrator named uh, Todd Alcott who does these insane, almost perfect uh, uh, time travel uh, design things. But what's in- interesting to me, just as a tendency, is like what what is up with uh, this kind of um, Everything is has everything has an art historical point of reference now, or so much of what you see in contemporary design is essentially an exploration into art history rather than an exploration into personal style. And I wonder if that's going to change, or if that, or if there is. I mean, if you go to design school now, do you and, and you do something? in your illustration class or your graphic design class that looks like a TWA ad from 1962, do you get an A? <laughs> that's a good question. I think there's, there's so much that's wrapped up in, in style. Now it's like, like instant nostalgia. Um, you know, even weird to see, um, you know, as, as fashion things come back, I mean, right now there's a lot of, a lot of nineties stuff that's hot, which was sure, which a lot of that was throwback to seventies stuff, which, you know, Mm -hmm. so it's just kind of wild that it's like this, this cycle that just keeps repeating itself. And, you know, I, in my gut, I'm like, well, I'm, I'm kind of more of a, I default to more of a modernist look myself, which, which in effect is also a little bit of a retro thing. You know, it's not that it's not that that's exactly a super fresh approach either. Right, exactly. And in some in some cases you could even say that that is that kind of is just a more rarefied informed style take, but it's still just a style take. Mm-hmm. I guess the truth is it's like I I'm I I guess I just I'm just asking questions. <laughs> As, <laughs> I don't have any solution to it. I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm just as, I'm just as fixated on images from the past as anybody, but, um, and, and ideas from the past and working with those ideas. I mean, sometimes when you're a songwriter, you know, you're thinking about songs that were written in the thirties, you know, you're like, there's a lot of times when you feel like you're almost in conversation with ideas that are completely archaic, but, um, in design, I just wonder like what the tendency is now. Like, I feel like, Google image search has, has undone a lot of new ideas. Yeah. yeah I, and it was interesting too, just a couple of weeks ago, I saw a clip with Dave Grohl and he was talking about how so much of his drumming style came from like disco drum tracks. And I, I would have never resonated with me before, but like going back and hearing the comparisons, I was like, Oh yeah. It's totally like he, he almost lifted some of that stuff. So it's well, just, I mean, there's some spe- specificity to that idea. That's really, uh, uh, you know, he plays the kick and the snare at the same time, which like by traditional drum rules is considered like forbidden, like that, that is not, that is going to be a less powerful way of drumming. But what's funny is that disco was the ultimate you know, disco would have the kick drum just going four on the floor. So it'd be like kick, kick, kick. And even though the snare would be happening on the back, it'd be like kick, snare, kick, snare. There was still a kick underneath the snare. And nobody said like, oh, this disco music isn't powerful. People were like, this <laughs> disco music is percussively oppressive. But, um, it, you know, it's, but Dave Grohl does that as well. And hip hop people do it as well. Because, I mean, hip hop drum programmers aren't even thinking about, replicating real drum patterns they're just doing what sounds cool and so um yeah it's just it there's a lot of different ways to work and and uh if you're not thinking about the rules at all it's it's very easy to break them well i think maybe that comes back to maybe the the hint to the answer of your question is i think once you've kind of figured out the the rules that's when you're you're allowed to to go break them or go retro or go <laughs> yeah. put the snare under your kick drum or, or whatever <laughs> exactly. the version of that is. Disco will never die. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's a good note to end on. Disco will never die. Um, John, it's been awesome having you on the show. Before we say goodbye for real here, 
um, tell our listeners and viewers, those who may also be joining us on YouTube, um, where they can find more about book and more about They Might Be Giants and, uh, and more about you. Uh, you can find out more than you ever wanted to know at uh, theymightbegiants.com. Uh, and, but there is a fun thing that we're kind of resuscitating. We are reintroducing this um, They Might Be Giants app. And um, you just go to the App Store. It's a free download at the Apple App Store. And there's also an, uh, uh, what do you, like a, an Android version of it as well. Um, but it's just a music player. It's uh, it, it's a design uh, that was put together with Paul Sayre. And uh, it's a beautiful uh, felt cassette uh, illustration that you can kind of manipulate. But it, it has a different song on it every day. It has five songs total as a player. And um, right now we're introducing songs from the upcoming release of book. And we're also um, putting on a bunch of rarities that haven't been anywhere else, like just weird stuff that we've done. There's like a demo from the, that we did for uh, that John Linnell put together for SpongeBob SquarePants, the musical. Uh, there's a demo that I did for uh, um, this uh, central park show, animated show on Apple plus. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a little bit, of a callback to our dial song service where you get like a, to hear some work in progress stuff and some rarities. And then of course, you know, popular album songs and, and fan favorites, but that app is totally free and it's at the app store. It's uh, it works again. You know, they keep on changing the way apps, you know, with Apple, you kind of got to keep up to date. So there was an interval of time where it didn't work, which is really frustrating because it was a lot to put it together in the first place. But um, so that, that is where I would point everyone. And then uh, that's where they would find book as well as at they might be giants.com. Yeah. You can buy copies of book at they might be giants.com. Um, I have to say we've, we sold uh, uh, just about 10,000 copies of it in, in, in advance. Um, and I think we're only printing 12,000 copies. So um, it's very possible that the, that the first edition, which, could easily be the only edition might sell out before it even <laughs> hits, hits uh, the bookstore. So um, if you're interested in the project, I would say, get it, get in on it now. All right, kids. Well, get them while they're hot. John, it's been a pleasure meeting you and chatting with you. And uh, thank you for being obsessed with design. Thank you so much, Josh. Okay, kids, that's episode 165 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. Thanks again to The Perfect Match for sponsoring today's episode. Visit theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed to learn more and get ready to bring your design skills to win. That's theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed to learn more. Add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.